11.2.1 is hypothesis testing for two sample means where sigma is unknown and unequal variances. So here's your summary page. Again, the conditions are the same as hypothesis testing for means with sigma unknown, whether you have one sample or two. Obviously, of two samples, we have to check the conditions for each sample. Random, sigma is unknown, and either the sample size is greater than or equal to 30, or the population distribution is approximately normal. And, of course, in this one, we also have to look at whether the variances are considered unequal or equal. So for this particular test, we're looking at variances considered unequal. So the null and alternative hypotheses, same as we have before. Um, a key thing here that you need to understand and note is that this T model is going to have N, the smaller of N1 minus one or N2 minus one degrees of freedom. And again, we're going to let Excel do that for us, but you can certainly do that yourself if you'd like. Step two, gather the data. Notice the test statistic looks the same as what we did before with a z-score, but now it's a t-score. So we're using s, which is the population standard deviation, I'm sorry, the sample standard deviation rather than sigma, and everything else is the same. Let's take a look at our first example. Suppose that Smith CPA firm in Chicago claims that its clients receive a larger tax refund on average than clients of its competitor. So let's stop right there. We're going to call Smith CPA one, and we're gonna call Jones and Company two, and we are saying that one is greater than two. So that means my null hypothesis is that mu one is equal to mu two, and my alternative hypothesis is that the people at Smith receive larger tax refunds. So M1 or Mu1 is greater than Mu2. To test the claim, we have 15 clients from Smith. So that's N1, randomly selected and found to have a mean tax refund, X bar one of 942 with a standard deviation S1 of 103. At Jones and Company, which is two, a random sample of 18, so N2 is 18, clients are surveyed and found to have a mean refund, X bar two, of 898 with a standard deviation of 95, whoops, S2. Test the claim made by Smith Firm at the 0 0.05 level of significance, that's alpha, assume that both population distributions are approximately normal. So we have everything we need. Let's check conditions before we continue. First, both are randomly selected. We are given that in the question. Both population standard deviations are unknown. Yes, clearly, because they aren't given to us. Both population distributions are approximately normal. Yep and unequal variances. And again, this is the tricky part, but they are in different parts of the city, and therefore we don't have reason to believe that they are equal. So conditions are met and we can move forward. The null and alternative hypotheses, again, mu1 is equal to mu2 or mu1 is greater than mu2. And again, if it makes more sense to you, please feel free to say M1 minus M2 is equal to zero and mu1 minus mu2 is greater than zero. Our test statistic, uh, the reason again I say this is because it helps us to know what value to put for mu1 minus mu2. So to find my t-score, I'm subtracting 942 and 898 and then subtracting what I expect the difference to be, which in this case is zero. And then same denominator as our last video, except that we're using S1 and S2 instead of sigma one uh, and sigma two. Again, we get 1.266. The critical value for the rejection region, this is a right-tailed test. And if we need 0 0.05 on the right, that means we need 0.95 to the left. And 
Again, this is a T inverse, and I think I forgot the comma. Remember, the comma is degrees of freedom. And we talked before, but we haven't um, figured it out yet. We said the degrees of freedom for this particular model is the lower of N1 minus 1, so 14, or N2 minus 1, which is 17. So the least value is 14. So this would be 0 0.95 comma 14. And that is where I came up with 1.761. So again, looking at my picture, 1.761 does not contain 1.266, so this is going to be a fail to reject. Uh, same thing, if we find our T value, remember this is a one-tailed test, and I'm going to the right, so this would be one, uh, this would be T dist right, because the T distribution is nice enough to give us a right-tailed test version. And then, of course, we're just using 1.266 and, again, the degrees of freedom of 14. Because P is greater than alpha, again, it tells us to fail to reject. So, again, our conclusion, based both on the rejection region and on the test statistic, uh, I'm sorry, P being greater than alpha, is that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So, remember, there's three parts. We say this is the data. This is what the data tells us to do. This is what it means. So with P greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. This indicates there is not sufficient evidence that the alternative is true. So this indicates there's not sufficient evidence at 0.05 level of significance to say the mean tax refunds at Smith CPA are greater than those at Jones and Company. And that's what our alternative hypothesis was. Again, to create our confidence interval, we will subtract x bar 1 minus x bar 2. We do not subtract the hypothesized difference, whether it's 0 or not. We use the same critical value we used for our rejection region. And we take the square root of s1 squared divided by n1 plus s2 squared divided by n2. And that gives us this interval. When we write our conclusion for our interval, we are sure to include what the interval means first. So with a 5% level of significance, we believe the tax returns at Smith CPA are between $17.23 less and $105.23 more on average than those at Jones & Company CPA. And then we talk about the hypothesized value in this case of zero. Since the hypothesized value of zero falls in our interval, this supports failing to reject the null hypothesis. Now let's take a look at how to use Excel. Now I'm going to go through the entire spreadsheet with you uh, in this example because this is the only example that we will do where we have sigma un unknown with unequal variances. So again, I'm not going to be doing anything crazy. All I'm doing is using the formulas. So if you start to get confused, break out your formula sheet. It has all of the formulas on it for each different type of test. So again, one of the first things you want to do is the degrees of freedom. So we talked about the fact that the degrees of freedom was the lesser of n1 minus 1 and n2 minus 1. So the, re the way that I set up my degrees of freedom is I said, if the first n value, 15, is less than 18, so if b3 is less than b6, I want degrees of freedom to be b3 minus 1, 15 minus 1, which is 14. If it's not, I want it to be b6 minus 1, which is 18 minus 1, or 17. Now, obviously, 14 is the lesser of the two, so the formula, or function, excuse me, has worked correctly. The t-score is just the t-score formula. So all I'm doing is having Excel go to the proper places. I'm taking the first mean minus the second mean minus the hypothesized difference, dividing that by the square root of b2 squared divided by b3, and then b5 squared divided by b6. That's my t-score. In terms of critical values, again, this is a T model, so we should be using T inverse. 
So T inverse of alpha and the degrees of freedom. T inverse of one minus alpha and the degrees of freedom for a right-tailed test. And then for a two-tailed test, I don't know why it says center. <laughs> this should say two-tailed, sorry. Um, for a two-tailed test, I can use the handy T inverse two-tail function, again, of alpha comma the degrees of freedom. For p-values, again, I'm using t-dist, and that would be the t-score, the degrees of freedom, comma, 1, t-dist right, or t-dist two-tail. Again, feel free to geek out and use the if-thens for reject and fail to reject, which would compare our p-value and our alpha levels. For our intervals, our point estimate, if you'll recall, is just mean 1 minus mean 2. So B1 minus B4. And then E is different whether it's left and right tailed or two tailed. So if it's one tailed, remember I'm going to use that positive critical value and I'm going to multiply it by the square root of B2 squared divided by B3 plus b5 squared divided by b6, which is just the standard deviations squared divided by each respective sample size. I'm going to do the exact same thing for the two-tailed, except I'm using that two-tailed critical value. So that's the only difference between the two e, or margin of error, values. And then, of course, the interval is centered at the point estimate, and I'm either subtracting the one-tailed margin of error and adding the one-tailed margin of error, or subtracting the two-tailed and adding the two-tailed. And if you'll notice, this particular example that we did was a right-tailed test. I did end up with 14 degrees of freedom, a T-score of 1.266, a critical value of positive 1.761, a P-value of positive 0.1132. We did fail to reject, and this is the interval that we came up with. Up next, we're going to take a look at hypothesis testing for two sample means where sigma is unknown, and in this case, we'll look at equal variances.